Uh, so we talked about, um, you know, we've, we've been alternating between this idea of um, decreasing the number of codons, increasing the number of codons, highlighting sort of their, um, the ways in which they can affect proteins, which, you know, are the, uh, in the context of this class, we've really discussed as, as um, our biocatalysts and enzymes within metabolic pathways. So you can imagine that if you had a rate limiting enzyme within a metabolic pathway, some of these techniques could be of interest to you in terms of uh, getting to a level where perhaps nature might not have, have easily uh, achieved. Although with directed evolution techniques, um, you can uh, accomplish quite a lot with the 20 natural amino acids. So this may be more of an instance of wanting to fine tune, say an enzyme active site um, where you wouldn't have so many um, natural amino acids that might do that kind of fine tuning that you want. Uh, so that was a perspective that's largely around protein engineering and um, in sort of a, a, a parallel um, genome engineering perspective, but also of relevance to metabolic engineering is this idea of the minimal genome. And so the minimal genome is, uh, one of the um, focuses of the, the J. Craig Venter Institute. Um, and the, their engineering as well as fundamental biological questions here. I think they like to emphasize um, some of the fundamental biology uh, in terms of just understanding what does it take in, in order for a, a in order for a cell to, to live or exist? What, is, what are the minimal requirements um, for life? And another way of framing this is that their goal is a cell so simple that they can figure out the, the function um, of every gene within it. And that's, you know, as much as we talk about E. coli being a simple and well annotated and tractable uh, organism, at a genetic level, it's still 4 million base pairs. And there's still a number of genes that um, are, are both redundant and that we don't know necessarily what their function may be. So the minimal genome, in part because of its minimal size, uh, was the first to be made using DNA synthesis entirely. Um, so again, this is kind of on the, on the fringe of what we might consider genome engineering, um, given that it, it was, did not involve a genome engineering or editing tool. Um, but, it, but as DNA synthesis becomes increasingly cheap, uh, we're going to see more examples of, of this kind of um, engineering by synthesis. Um, now I, I see a, a raised hand, so I'll take a question. Yeah, I was wondering, I guess I can sort of guess the answer just based on bioinformatics, but how do they know that that's the minimal genome? Like there's all those little, little red boxes. How exactly are they saying you know, there's nothing essential in the gap between five and six or something like that? Yeah, so um, that, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of work that this builds upon. This is um, illustrating, these figures are from the third synthetic iteration of this. Um, and so what they did in short, and I'm probably making some oversimplifications here, is they took a, um, they took a, a, a one of the smallest naturally occurring genomes, and I think it was a Mycobacterium sphagmatis, um, and it was maybe about a million base pairs or so to begin with, maybe 1.1 or 1.5. And uh, they and perhaps others had performed what's known as transposon mutagenesis, um, which is your standard technique um, where you have where you generate a library of strains each having a transposon that most likely also has some kind of selectable marker um, with randomly inserted within one part within the genome and then you can go back and map and see okay what areas weren't hit with the transposon and i think that influenced the first iteration of their design um, such that then they could say all right, we're going to try to use DNA synthesis to put together this genome. And so in their first version, which they called Cynthia, I believe, um, 1.0, uh, it was still about, if not 800,000 base pairs, maybe close to a million. And 
they 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 did describe it as maybe the minimal genome but it at the time right um oh in fact sorry i i can see it clearly here now the that the first version was um one million base pairs so if i was interpreting this figure now more accurately it's showing you in red the regions that were deemed to be um you know uh, essential for um going from this first version to this third version but they have not as far as i know made the claim yet that every single base within this smaller genome is essential that that is their ultimate goal and i think um having DNA synthesis uh, is a tool that allows them to quickly jump from something like a 1 million base pair genome to about half the size. Uh, and by the way, quickly here, I guess, is relative. Uh, these are costly and multi-year efforts. Um, yeah, but, but does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. Right, so um, they... As they were the first to make a, a synthetic bacterial genome, there had been some work done on synthetic viral genomes. Uh, some bacteriophage have a genome that's only, you know, as small as 5,000 base pairs. Um, for, for this kind of effort, they had to develop quite a number of techniques uh, beyond the synthesis stage, which is, um, you know, assembly techniques. So it was around that era that, um, I think uh, it was Daniel Gibson of the Craig Venter Institute came up with an, a one-pot isothermal assembly um, based on homology to be able to, um, instead of using restriction enzymes, um, just have um, an exonuclease and a ligase, um, and I believe also a polymerase for gap filling in order to um, enable uh, for multi-piece assembly. Uh, of potentially very large sizes in a, in a what's shown here to be an Eppendorf tube, but in vitro. And then um, one of the keys to making this work was actually moving these uh, sequences, transforming them into yeast, as yeast is so excellent at homologous recombination. Um, that's actually the, the first um, organism that makes sense for kind of getting these, these genome fragments um, all you need is a yeast origin of replication or some kind of selectable marker. Then you can take it out of the yeast. And, and by the way, you really want this because of the ability then for your DNA sequence to be preserved and to propagate. Those are things that you wouldn't have happen in vitro. Um, and then they, they also came up with a genome transplantation methodology so that you could have your mycobacterium um, the natural variant, or perhaps an earlier synthetic variant, and then you could essentially uh, transplant in this this other genome. Now there's two, and then um, you might have some ways, perhaps with selection, um, to be able to isolate. Um, you know, actually, what you'd really need, based on what I just described, is some kind of counter selection, um, or some way to ensure that only one genome um, is maintained, and then and then you would have this this swap. Um, and so, so the, the minimal genome, I like to think of from metabolic engineering perspectives, being closer to that aspirational blank canvas, um, where then in terms of metabolic pathway maps, um, or just any other kinds of redundancies that you might face in a normal bacterial host, uh, you now know that, that you, don't, you, you don't have as much of that at least, or you know what it is. Um, giving you increased predictability over your design. Um, of course, the reality is that the, this, neither of these strains can actually survive on minimal media on their own. Um, the definition here of, of minimal and what's essential um, is a little bit interesting because it's, these, are, these are oxytropes. So they don't have everything that they need to be able to support their own growth from a simple carbon source, which means that from a practical perspective, you couldn't use these organisms efficiently for metabolic engineering without supplying um, a lot of potentially amino acids, um, also nucleotides, et cetera, um, that are going to be too expensive to scale up. So it, it, it's still in the spirit of something that could be useful. And in fact, the Craig Venter Institute's partner 
company, the synthetic genomics, um, has a, a good bit of metabolic engineering expertise. So um, they likely use and, and certainly do use different strains um, for for all their projects. Um, uh, I don't know if if this if any of these um, variants have have actually ever had a metabolic pathway um, introduced into them. 